So, Jamal, uh, you are um, another one of uh, the uh, challengers that we've had on, um, uh, folks who are challenging longtime, uh, in many instances, establishment Democrats, uh, Democrats who uh, perhaps should be a little bit more reliably uh, progressive in their voting. Um, First off, tell us, uh, you know, I, I watched your announcement video. I thought it was very impressive. Um, you're running in uh, New York's 16th district. This is Elliot Engel's uh, district. He's been there for 16 terms. Uh, mm-hmm. I, you're a uh, an educator. Your math is probably better than mine, but that's 32 years. Uh, that's a long, <laughs> long time. And so he has quite a record. And frankly, um, why don't you tell us what you think is sort of problematic with that record? Well, what, what's problematic is the fact that it is a long time, and he hasn't used that time to build a movement across the district, right? So when you look at certain parts of the district, you see uh, rent burdens as high as 57%. You see poverty reaching levels of 20%. You see homeless, homelessness running rampant in certain parts of the district, and you see an education crisis and an addiction crisis. So someone who's been in office for that long you would think that they would be in every corner of the district working with as many people as possible to make sure we solve these problems. Instead, he's focused on one section of the district. He's beholden to and accountable to his corporate backers while ignoring the majority of the people in the district. That's unacceptable. I've lived in this district for almost 10 years. I've worked in this district for 10 years. I meet the people and I work with the people who have been most disenfranchised and I know their plight and I know their struggle and I come from the same places they come from. In the richest country in the world, it's unacceptable to have 15.5 million people living in poverty across the country. And in this district, we see it as being rampant. So there's a lot more work to do. And and, and I guess that's I mean, uh, you know, like I don't know how much and maybe you have a better sense of this. I mean, how much can a congressperson who is obviously the federal uh, position do about, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the sort of the the narrower questions within a district. Uh, I'm curious about that. The other thing that I think is more obvious to me is that if folks who represent districts like that are not laser focused on these problems, who will be across the country? Correct. Right. You have to. The district should be representative of the people in the district. And right now, Congressman Engel does not represent the majority of the people in the district. Any elected official, whether it's local, state or federal, have to. Uh, vote and work in alignment with their priorities, right? So someone in Congress, if they if they value peace over war, if they value people over profit, if they value schools and education over bombs and incarceration, that's what they will vote for, that's what they will fight for, and that's what they will push for. So as a congressional representative, I will use that position in that bully pulpit to scream from the mountaintops about a new vision, not just for the district, for, but for the country. Let's build Build more community schools. Let's close prisons. Let's focus on addiction, not as a crime, but as a health crisis that needs to be treated uh, accordingly. Let's focus on peace in the Middle East and a foreign policy that, that looks at diplomacy more than we look at war. It's about being rooted in our humanity. And Congressman Engel has shown he is not rooted in humanity. He is rooted in profit. He is rooted in war. And he votes for things that decimates communities like the crime. Crime bill, for example. So while I'm working in education, uh, fighting against and stopping the school to prison pipeline for a crime bill that's leading to the proliferation of private prisons and more incarceration, particularly in the New York State area. Uh, and, and when you say that he's uh, supportive of these things that you like, you say you mentioned uh, that he voted for the 1994 crime bill, uh, which, you know, to be fair, uh, a, a, a lot of Democrats did. Uh, some of the most progressive Democrats did. But many of them have at least come back out and said mistake. Um, he voted to deregulate Wall Street. I don't know where he stands on that today. But uh, certainly the um, uh, we had a 2008 crisis, which decimated particularly people in your district. I mean, uh, I've looked at uh, I remember looking at maps after the 2008 financial crisis and Manhattan itself, no foreclosures. But in areas of the Bronx, 
um, a tremendous amount of foreclosures. Uh, folks were hit really hard up there. And then, of course, he also voted for the Iraq War. I mean, what? What? Uh, I, I, I want to challenge you to say something positive, but it's very difficult because uh, let me ask you this. The New York 16th. How blue of a district is this? In other words, is this a district that sometimes people say, well, it's one of those frontline districts, um, you know, uh, you have to have someone who'll support, uh, uh, you know, George Bush's Iraq war. You'll have to have someone who will deregulate Wall Street. You have to have someone who's going to, um, you know, be super tough on crime. And, uh, you know, even if, though there's uh, racial disparities in this type of thing, we have to have someone who supported George Bush's horrible education um, uh, program, No Child Left Behind, which which we'll talk more about because you're an educator. Is this one of those districts where you have to play it safe or is this one of those districts like many in New York state that should be leaders of progressive uh, ideas and issues around the country. It is not a purple district. It is a deep blue district and it has been for decades. So the leader within this district can be incredibly bold in in pushing progressive uh, policy and progressive ideology across the district and across the country. And as you mentioned, he has not done that. And to your point, you're right. Many Democrats did vote for the 1994 Crown Bill. The problem is they were wrong. And the reason why they were wrong, because too many Democrats, particularly moderate and centrist Democrats, have been beholden to corporations for decades while ignoring the people. This is why we got to get big money out of politics. This is why we have to deal with economic inequality in our country in a very serious way, in the same way that Bernie Sanders is talking about it and Elizabeth Warren are talking about it as progressive candidates. This is a deep blue district. It has been for decades, and he has not led. The thing we hear mostly throughout the district is we do not see him. He is not engaged, and it's time for a change. And those three things are, are what we're hearing as we've canvassed uh, throughout the summer. And we're going to continue to hear that. And that's why we're giving uh, the voters a viable option so that more than 7 percent of the electorate can come out during the primary, which is what happened in 2018, which is deplorable. Wow. All right. Well, uh, Jamal Bowman, we're going to take a break. When we come back, I want to go through a couple of the issues that uh, people can read about you supporting on your website. Um, But uh, I want to go through a couple of those. I want to hear what your plan is to bring out more people uh, to vote uh, and what your strategy is uh, to win this primary. And lastly, I want to obviously talk to you about education. Uh, You're a principal of a a very successful public school up in Bronx and the Bronx. And um, I'm, I'm fascinated to get your take, particularly based upon where we are coming out of really two administrations Well, this third one is even uh, more dismal in terms of uh, its perspective on on public education. we got to take a quick break. I'm Sam Cedar. This is Ring of Fire Radio. We'll be back in a moment.